And we're back. Welcome back, and happy Thursday. Today, we will pivot in a manner of sorts to kernels. Now, kernels are used very well, in a clever way, by support vector machines. But kernels are not limited to support vector machines. So let's jump in. Well, we left off last time. We talked about this idea of finding a linear hypothesis with a preference towards one that maximized the margin. And we said that maximizing the margin increased the robustness of your final best hypothesis because if you add noise to your in-sample points, that noise process tends to change the position of that data, data point in feature space. And if you change the position in feature space, those points that have a larger margin will tend not to flip in their class label from plus one to minus one or from minus one to plus one. And so we posed an approach for measuring the distance between a point off the hyperplane and the hyperplane itself. And we came up with an expression for finding the, that's the working hypothesis, W, our instantiation of a weight vector, that also maximized the margin. And that led to our objective, minimizing one half W transpose W. But we also included some constraints. And those constraints had to do with the scaling up and scaling down of our hyperplane, our weight vector W, such that for the closest off-plane point, W transpose Xn plus B is equal to 1. And so we can achieve also that effect by multiplying our W transpose B by Yn, and we came up with an expression for our constraint subject to Yn times quantity W transpose Xn plus B greater than or equal to 1. Now that just says that for the closest off-plane point, this expression is greater than or equal to 1. Why? Because this score, W transpose Xn plus B, is positive for those points on the plus side of the line and negative for those points on the minus side of the line. So when you multiply by the ground truth class label, Yn, which is either plus 1, minus 1, this expression for the closest off-plane point is precisely equal to 1. But for those points that are not the closest to the plane, the so-called interior points, this expression is greater than 1. And so this is our objective, and we sought to eliminate this inequality constraint through Lagrangian optimization. And so we called the equality version of our constraint the so-called Lagrangian slack, and we modulate that with a Lagrange variable alpha, and there's a unique alpha, alpha n, for each one of the in-sample points xn. And so this gave us an equivalent unconstrained formula, a modified formula for our objective that we call the Lagrangian. And so the Lagrangian is parametrized in terms of three things. We have our weight vector W, our bias term B, and then we also have alpha, which is big N, many Lagrange variables, one for each of our in-sample points. And so this expression, this Lagrangian formulation, is also called the primal formulation. And we take this primal form and we solve this minimization problem with respect to parameters W and B. We find that solution. So here's our W by setting the gradient of the Lagrangian, the primal form, with respect to W and B to zero, and then solve it. So this is our solution for W, and this is our other solution. We plug that back in to the primal form and get the dual formulation. And that results in an expression that only has three variables, our alphas. And so we then maximize this dual formulation with respect to alpha, and we use a quadratic programming solver in order to do so. Once we get our alphas, we then construct our weight vector by weighted sum for those 
in sample points whose alpha value is greater than zero, non-zero. And those are our so-called support vectors. And they're called support vectors because you can think of them as holding up the margin, i.e. holding the hyperplane in place. And then we can also solve for our bias term B using any of those support vector values, X, M. All right. So let's take a look at kernels. Now, of course, when we compute the support vector machine in the input representation, we have this dual formulation and solving this minimization problem in terms of this alpha, our set of feasible solutions, the instantiations of alpha, where this dual formulation achieves its minimum, we notice this expression has this Xn transpose Xm. Now, that is the inner product between instantiations of X with all other instantiations of X. And so when we convert into Z space, we're no longer dealing with our X vectors. We're calling our Zs, recall, there are five function nonlinear transformation on X. So for each Xn, we have a corresponding Zn that you obtain through this nonlinear transformation, this phi function. And that's the only real difference between an SVM in the input representation and our feature space. And again, this feature space is purposed with the ability to draw nonlinear decision boundaries by training a linear model after you've projected into this highly dimensional nonlinear feature space. Okay. And so let's take a look at this inner product, how it changes. You notice it's the inner product between each Z point and every other Z point. So in order to compute the support vector machine then in feature space or Z space, we need to define this inner product in Z space. And so here with this Z space version of our support vector machine, if we evaluate our final best hypothesis G, that's sine W transpose Z plus our bias term. Again, we need Z inner product in Z space to do that. And then our weight vector is just the linear combination of those support vectors in Z space. And then when we look at our constraints, our constraints also need our inner product. It's just Y times W transpose Z plus B is equal to 1. So we also need that bias term. So in order to then compute our support vector machine in Z space, we need a definition of this inner product Zn transpose Zm in feature space. So how can we do this? Well, if we want the inner product in Z space, well, we need to compute our phi function on our Z x vector and our phi function on, let's call it our x prime vector. If we want the inner product in z space, where phi function on x is our z, and phi function on x prime is our other vector in z space, z prime. So we're given two vectors from our original input space representation, and we have our inner product. We want to compute this inner product in z space, z transpose z prime. And so now we're going to define a function. And that function is going to be the function that computes this inner product in Z space, Z transpose Z prime. So let's call this some function K. And K is going to input our original two input space vectors. And this K has arity too. So it's going to input X and X prime. And this function has a name. We're going to call this function a kernel. So a kernel is nothing more than some function for which you input your two vectors in the original input space representation, x space. So it's defined in x space. And what it calculates is a value where that value is the same as the value of the inner product between the transformed x vectors in z space. Okay. So let's take a look at an example of this kernel function evaluated on x and x prime. So let's imagine a second order polynomial phi function. You take your input space representation and you get a point Z. It's equivalent in Z space and feature space. And this is just an expansion that includes a dummy variable one or value one. The first feature X1, X2, X1 squared, first feature squared, X2 squared, and then the cross terms X1, X2. 
So this is a one, two, three, four, five, six dimensional, six dimensional transformation on our X, which is in two dimensions. So we're going through phi from R2 to R6. It's an expansive mapping. And so now we can take our kernel, and our kernel is the equivalent of performing the inner product between Z and Z prime. So let's take this inner product, and let's imagine our phi function then, our transformation to Z space, was this particular expansive mapping from R2 to R6 through a second order polynomial expansion, second order polynomial phi function. So if we multiplied two vectors, Z and Z prime, using this expansion, well, we get 1 plus x1, x1 prime, plus x2, x2 prime, plus x1 squared, x2, x1 squared, x1 prime squared, plus x2 squared, x2 prime squared, plus the product of the cross terms, x1, x1 prime, x2, x2 prime. And this is going to be our expansion, and it's literally just the product of this expansion for x and the same expansion for x prime. So that would be 1, x1 prime, x2 prime, x1 prime squared, x2 prime squared, x1 prime, x2 prime. And we're just doing the element-wise product and summing those terms together, which is our inner product. All right. So this is an example of a kernel. It's a function defined in our input space representation, and it computes value equivalent to what you would get if you computed the phi function on our inputs and then took the inner product between the transform vectors in Z space. So this is a valid kernel. All right. So one of the questions then, and this is the so-called kernel trick, is can we compute this kernel without this transformation phi? Now, let's consider the following kernel function. We have our x and x prime in our input space representation, and it's defined as follows. 1 plus x transpose x prime quantity squared. Now, if I perform that inner product between x's in two dimensions, in R2, I get 1 plus x1, x1 prime plus x2, x2 prime quantity squared. The x1, x1 prime, x2, x2 prime is just the inner product between x transpose and x prime for a two-dimensional real-valued x input space data point or vector. So now let's perform the square here. Well, we have 1, okay, and then we're going to have the square of each term. So I have x1 squared, x1 prime squared. Uh, then we're going to have x2 squared, x2 prime squared. Okay, that's each one of these terms times itself. And then we're going to have 2 times the cross terms. That's 2 times x1, x1 prime, 2 times x2, x2 prime, plus 2 times x1, x1 prime, x2, x2 prime. And so if we were to take this result, this result then, if it were a kernel, that would be the result of the inner product between two different vectors in Z space. Now, given that this inner product in Z space would be Z transpose Z prime, we can imagine now that for each term, there's one position in Z space. So it would be one, two, three, four, five, six terms because it's a six-dimensional expansive five-function mapping we're imagining. So we're just going to tease apart each term with an equivalent or equal contribution from the z vector and from the z prime vector. And so you'll notice here you have a, an unprimed version, x1 squared, and a prime version, x1 prime squared. So we're just going to imagine that if we separate them out, let's see what we get for the corresponding z vectors. So we have 1 is the result of 1 times 1, so we write 1 and 1. Here we have x1 prime squared, x2 prime squared. So we're going to write down x1 squared, x1 prime squared. We have x2 and x2 prime squared. Okay, so it's x2 and x2 prime squared. And then here we have 2 times x1, x1 prime. Well, we have an x1 and x1 prime, but let's split this two and a half. 
2 is the same as multiplying radical 2 by itself. So for one vector, we'll say it contributes radical 2 x1. In the primed version, it contributes radical 2 times x1 prime. So we'll do the same with the other cross terms. So we have radical 2 x2, radical 2 x2 prime, and then lastly, radical 2 x1 x2, radical 2 x1 prime x2 prime. And so now this first vector, that would be our z vector, the second vector, that would be our z prime vector, and we get this expression for the kernel function if we take z transpose z prime. And so that means this particular inner product, 1 plus x transpose x prime quantity squared, is the same as mapping through this phi function, this six-dimensional expansive mapping. It's the inner product through that mapping in z space between this z and this z prime. So absolutely, this is a valid kernel. Okay, so we've done that directly. Let's take a look more generally at arbitrary complexities for this nonlinear expansive mapping. A so-called polynomial kernel, and what we showed was a second order polynomial. A polynomial kernel takes our input space representation from d-dimensional real valued space to some other dimensional space through a phi function, which is a polynomial of degree q. And the kernel function, the equivalent kernel function, defined on the input space representation is 1 plus x transpose x prime, the inner product, raised to the q power. That's our polynomial. So if we take the inner product, well, we have d many terms because our x vectors are from d-dimensional real-valued space. So we get 1 plus those d many terms, uh, all of that quantity raised to the q power. So if we were to look at this for, say, d equals 10 and q equals 100, we can compute this kernel very, very easily. 1 plus, okay, so that's one addition. If we take this inner product, that is as many steps as there are dimensions to do that inner product. Then we take the sum, okay, and then after that, we exponentiate it to the q. That can be done all very easily. You can also adjust the scale by including a scalar uh, with this x transpose x prime. And so even if your degree is 100 or even 1,000, if you keep this to x space, you can perform this kernel function through very simple operations. But that's not always the case. If you were to go through this transformation and get two z vectors, that's going to be a very big z vector, and it's going to take a lot more computation to do the transformation to z space and then do the inner product in that z space. And so computing this kernel purely in x space, it gives you the same result as if you perform the, tra the transformation to z space through the phi function, actually compute it, but it requires far less computation because you have more terms in the inner product if you actually perform the phi function and do the inner product in z space versus if you calculate this function, keeping it solely in the input space representation in x space. And so one of the things that you only need in order for your kernel to exist, kernel to be valid rather, is you only need this kernel function to be an inner product in some z, z space, that the z space has to exist. You have to show that ah, a valid mapping to z space phi function exists. So let's take, for example, this so-called radial basis kernel. It's a real kernel. And we have our kernel function, k x x prime, is e to the minus gamma magnitude of x minus x prime squared. So we have the magnitude squared here the norm squared. So let's take a simple example. So we have our kernel, and we compute our radial basis on the, as our kernel function. And now we have e to the minus x minus x prime quantity squared. Now, of course, if we perform this square, e to the minus, that's x squared, plus x prime squared minus 2x x prime. 
the square of each term times two the times the cross term. So now, if we were to compute this, that would be e to the minus x squared, e to the minus x prime squared, times e minus minus, that's plus, to the 2x x prime. Okay, so now what we can do then is let's try to separate this into the x term and the x prime terms. So we have our e to the minus x, that's here. We have our e to the minus x prime squared, that's here, that's our primed term. And now what, le what we're left with is this e to the minus, e to the rather to the positive, e to the 2x x prime. And so what we can do then for this term, we can take the Taylor series approximation of e to the 2x x prime. If we do so, I encourage you to look up the Taylor series approximation for e to the x. That's just the sum for k goes from 0 to infinity of 2 to the k, x to the k power, x prime to the k power upon k factorial. That's just the Taylor series approximation of e to the 2x x prime power. And so if we do that, well, what do we imagine here? What we imagine then is we can bring these e to the minus x squared, e to the minus x prime squared inside of our summation. And if we group together the two terms, we get a term inside of our sum. k goes from 0 to infinity. We get e to the minus x squared times x to the k power, we get e to the minus x prime squared times x prime to the k power. And then we can take this 2 to the k upon k factorial, and we give part of it to the x term and part of it to the x prime term. So 2 to the k over k factorial is like the radical of 2 to the k over k factorial times itself. So then we'd write radical 2 to the k over k factorial. We give one portion, equal portion here, and we have radical 2 to the k upon k factorial, another portion that. So in essence, what we get is radical 2 to the k upon k factorial e to the minus x squared x to the k, and then we also have another term, radical 2 to the k over k factorial e to the minus x prime squared x prime to the k. Now, if we look at this, for the k equals 0 term, we get a value. For the k equals 1 term, we get another value. And this looks like each term here, a component for a vector that has an infinite dimensionality. And so you can treat this sum, this infinite sum, as being the inner product between two transformed versions of our input space representation, where that phi function maps from the dimensionality R super D associated with X to R super infinity, some infinite real valued feature space. And so, yes, while the idea of an infinite dimensionality feature space is more of a theoretical concept. It seems it, it, it is a, an actual feature space, and we've shown that it's a feature space. This one has an infinite dimensionality. All right. So, yes, absolutely. The radial basis kernel is a valid kernel because a Z space exists. Which Z space? It's this infinite dimensionality Z space with the individual terms of that z vector is defined as follows. That radical term, e to the power term, and x to the power term. All right. So if we transform our input space representation to an infinite dimensional z space, is this overkill? Well, not really, because again, we get a small finite number of support vectors. And so if we started out 
with a target function in green, as depicted here in the graph. And we classified our data in sample data with a radial basis kernel support vector machine. And then after getting our final list hypothesis, we mapped our support vectors, which live in Z space, back to X space. Those mapped vectors are going to be these dark points here, these, this black line. This black line here is the pre-image of the support vectors in Z space. And you can see there's a pretty good coincidence between our original target function, which was the green, and our mapped pre-images from Z space back to the input space representation. Now, of course, any support vectors that you show in X space through this pre-image, they're pre-images of support vectors, but not the support vectors themselves. It's really important to remember the support vectors live in Z space because that's where you're building the support vector machine and finding the support vectors. Okay, so now in our dual formulation, we can change our coefficient matrix that we pass to quadratic programming and get the support vector formulation in Z space. And so here we repeat the quadratic programming problem for the dual formulation, that's finding the minimization that provides the alphas, and we fed into the quadratic programming solver uh, the following coefficient matrix, which is just the product of the labels and the X vectors for all combinations. And so now you'll notice here, in each of these entries in the coefficient matrix, we have an inner product. We have X1 transposed with all the other vectors, second row X2 transpose with all the other vectors. So we have an inner product portion involving our X vectors. So all we do then is just convert this inner product in X space with our kernel function to calculate an inner product in Z space. And that has the effect of changing each one of these, for example, XI transpose XJs to be the equivalent ZI transpose ZJ. All right. So you can do this with your kernel function, changing the quadratic program coefficient matrix that you feed into your QP solver. All right. And so now, then, your final best hypothesis for the support vector machine uh, in Z space is then our g of x, because when you're computing your final best hypothesis on input, you input x, is just sine w transpose z, so you compute phi function on that x, plus b. And you can express that final best hypothesis with your kernel function. And so as a result of your Lagrangian solution, you have a definition for your w vector, for your final best hypothesis, and it's defined in terms of the support vectors in Z space are ZNs for which the corresponding Lagrange variables, alpha N, are greater than zero. So once you get that weighted combination, well, what do you do? You calculate this G of X sine W transpose ZX. If you substitute in that W, you get the sum for all the support vectors, alpha N, Y N, Z N uh, transpose because it's W transpose times Z. Now, what is this ZN transpose times Z? That's nothing more than your kernel function, K of XN and X. And so now, our final best hypothesis becomes the sine, plus one, minus one, for all of the support, vec support Lagrange variables that are greater than zero, i.e. Um, related to the support vectors, of alpha n, y n, kernel function evaluated between each one of those support vectors, x n, and the input parameter to your g of x, x. And so you use the kernel function to do this. Likewise, you select a single x n and alpha n, and you can calculate the bias term by solving. It's just y m minus, for all the support vectors and their Lagrange variables, alpha n, y n, kernel function between support vectors and uh, the mth input, input vector. And so this depends on your data set 
and the complexity, therefore, for this highly nonlinear support vector machine in Z-space, your complexity is defined in terms of a relatively small number of support vectors, again, in Z-space. And so one of the questions you might be asking, it's a great question, how are we sure that the Z-space really exists? So we need a recipe for showing that a kernel is valid. And so you can do this by construction. As we did, you have to show that a Z-space actually exists, that there is a phi-function mapping that your kernel function defined in X-space produces in inner product four. And that was our direct construction. You can also show a number of mathematical properties called Mercer's conditions. And there are a standard set of Mercer's kernels that people have demonstrated, and you just have to show that your kernel is one of them or some set of operations on these. So for example, the product of two Mercer's kernels is also a Mercer kernel. An affine transformation, scalar plus a shift, is also a Mercer kernel if, it, if you start with a Mercer kernel. And then this last approach, carefree, you just don't care. You just construct the kernel and hope that it works out. So let's take a look at Mercer's conditions. That if you have a kernel function, it's a valid kernel if and only if it's symmetric and its gram matrix, which is the evaluation of the kernel in your in-sample data between pairs of points, if this gram matrix is positive semi-definite. Positive semi-definite meaning X transpose times your gram matrix X is always greater than or equal to zero. So that means for all X greater than zero, the product of this linear system, your gram matrix times X is always positive or zero. Um, so your gram matrix being positive semi-definite, if you have these two properties, symmetric and positive semi-definite, uh, then said kernel is a so-called Mercer kernel. It's a valid kernel. Okay, and so let's take a look at this next example that deals with aspects of a non-linearly separable data set. And this is called soft march, and this will complete our full exposition of support vector machines. The kernel gives you the ability to draw nonlinear decision boundaries. But sometimes your data is only slightly nonlinearly separable. Other times your data is very drastically nonlinearly separable. Let's draw our attention to this data set on the left hand side. We see that for the most part, the points are separable by this linear hypothesis in our input space representation, except for two oddballs, two outliers. We have this point and we have that point. Now, of course, if we have a kernel function, we can spend our wiggliness, our nonlinear decision boundaries, degrees of freedom, pursuing making sure that data, the data point is correctly classified, and also pursuing to make sure that that data point is correctly classified. But that's a lot of nonlinear behavior in your decision boundary in effort of trying to pursue just a small number of data points. And so in this case, you would decide, and it's the right choice, to tolerate some errors insisting that EN is zero. Because if you insist that EN is zero, well, you're gonna spend your degrees of freedom trying to pursue a very small number of points that are outliers to begin with. Now, if you decided, okay, I'm gonna relax things and allow EN to be non-zero, then you're going to have better generalization performance out of sample error is going to be better. Now, of course, that's different from the case where you have the following scenario. Your data set is geometry is oriented radially, and you have all of the blue points are shorter distance from origin versus all the red points are larger distance from origin. This is drastic nonlinear geometry uh, for your data points. Kernels were intended to deal with this latter case, things that are drastically nonlinear in the geometry. And so when you want to produce a final best hypothesis that works well in the slightly nonlinear case, this is where you need a so-called soft margin. You allow a number of small number of violations of this idea of a margin. And so we can use both of these in a support vector machine. We can say, have this nonlinear behavior, 
expression is going to be less than 1. So if it's less than 1, okay, so what are we going to do? We're going to subtract off some quantity yet to be determined from the right-hand side of the inequality. And we're going to use Greek letter xi. Uh, xi, you could pronounce it xi, xi. Now, xi is going to be greater than or equal to 0. When xi is 0, we have a point on the margin. When xi is greater than 0, for the greater than case, it's going to be a margin violation. As we see here, at this point, it has an associated margin violation. And so essentially what we're going to do is we're going to change our constraint from what it was for the original formulation for the Lagrangian to this new formulation that includes our margin violations. So now we're going to add up our margin violations, and we want to keep this sum of margin violations, one for each point, we want to keep it to be very, very small. So our total number of margin violations could mean that we have a margin violation for every of the big N many in sample points. So we're going to sum together psi n, one psi for each one of our big N many in sample points. So our total violations are the sum, little n goes from one to big N of psi n. So we're going to incorporate with our max margin objectives our additional term that includes this modified constraint, but we're also going to say keep our total violation small because we want, only want to use margin violations in this case where we're only slightly nonlinear, not when we're drastically nonlinear. Okay, so let's take a look at what this objective would look like. So, so our objective, again, we want to maximize the margin, so we minimize one-half W transpose W. That hasn't changed. But what has changed is we're introducing now this modulating variable C plus our sum of psi n, our margin violations. So because this is a minimization problem, it's going to try as much as possible when it finds a hyperplane and instantiation of our weight vector, it does not want to have a lot of psi n's that are large because it favors small and few margin violations. Now this variable C tells us how much we're going to pay attention to this guidance here about so-called soft margins. If C is small, we can afford a lot of margin violations. If C is large, we're saying mm, don't include or a lot for instantiations W that are associated with a large number of margin violations. So now then, we take our constraint subject to Yn times the score W transpose Xn plus B is greater than or equal to 1 minus our violation Xi n. And we also have each of the Xi n is greater than or equal to 0. And so now our variables that we're going to use for feasible solution are weight vector W, bias term B, but also our Xi vector, those big N many Xi n's, one for each one of the N many, big N many in sample points. So what this says is that you penalize for margin violation but you're not going to reward for non-violation of margin. You're only saying penalize if there's too much margin violation. All right. So this is our new form of the Lagrangian. It looks just like the old form, except a few more things involving our psi vector. So we have our max margin criteria. We have our sum of the margin violations. We have our constraint here. Now this constraint has been made into an equality constraint. So we subtract, and we started out, we had Yn, W transpose Xn plus B, and we said greater than equal to one minus Xi n. So we subtract this quantity from both sides of the inequality, and we're left with Yn, W transpose Xn plus B, and then we say minus 1 plus psi n greater than or equal to 0. So now we change this greater than to just equal to, and we include our Lagrangian alpha n times this new version of this Lagrangian slack that includes our margin violation. And so this is our Lagrange variable. This is our new version of our Lagrangian slack, and this becomes our objective our penalty term that encourages correct classifications allotting for a small number of margin violations, xi n.
All right, so then we also had that constraint where we said that the sum, these psi n's are all greater than or equal to zero. Now, of course, as psi n greater than or equal to zero, well, that is a constraint that we can turn into an equality constraint. And if we can turn it into an equality constraint, we include that Lagrange variable, another one, and this is beta m, and they have to be different. Here's alpha, here's beta. And that constraint looks like psi n greater than or equal to zero. So we turn it to an equality constraint, psi n equal to zero, and we multiply that by Lagrange variable bn. And we negate it because we want that to be small. And we're summing together all of these psi's across the entire data set. And so we include it as a negative sum over all of the psi n. And that's now our second term. So now we have a new form of our Lagrangian. And we're going to take in the primal formulation, which this is, it's in terms of W and B, our original parameters, weight vector and bias, psi vector, that is our margin violations. We have then our alphas, which are our Lagrange vector, or Lagrange variables. And then we have beta, which is Lagrange variable uh, for the margin violation term. And so we're going to minimize with respect to W, B, and psi. And then we're going to substitute the result of that minimization, take the gradient with respect to each one of these sets to zero, and then we're going to substitute back into the primal form to get the dual formulation and then maximize with respect to the Lagrange variables alpha n and b n. And this is exactly a saddle point. And so here, if we take the Lagrangian with respect to our parameters, things cancel out wonderfully. So you notice here for the gradient with respect to w, we have a w term here, and that's 2 times 1 half times w when we take the gradient, and we have a w term here, so that's alpha n, y n, w. Take the derivative with respect to w, that's just alpha n, y n. And so we get the same expression we got before without the margin violations. So now if we take the gradient with respect to the bias term b, well, we only have one term that has the b. It's alpha n times y n times b. And so if we have that set it to zero, so that's minus our sum alpha n y n equals zero. Okay, and that's the same as saying the sum alpha n y n equals zero if we multiply both sides of equality by negative one. And then lastly, if we take that gradient with respect to psi n, we get the following. We see a psi n here, it's modified, it's multiplied by c. We see a psi n here, that's alpha n times psi n. And then we see a psi n here, that's minus beta n times psi n. So we take that derivative, psi n in each of those terms to the one power. So we get a c minus alpha minus beta, set that gradient to zero, and we get c minus alpha minus beta is equal to zero. And so if we look at this, well, we know that alpha for this expression to be zero, alpha cannot be bigger than c, right? Um, and if alpha cannot be bigger than c, that gives us a bound on the value of alpha. We said alpha n is greater than or equal to zero, but we also know that alpha n can't be greater than c. So this adds a limit on the size that alpha can be. All right, so now let's look at the dual formulation after we make the substitution. Well, if we make the substitution, we a lot of things cancel out, and we get back the identical dual formulation that we got before. We have our sum of alpha n minus one half double summation y n y m at alpha n alpha m x n x m, and now it's subject to not our alpha greater than zero. Now it's alpha greater than zero but at most C over all the data points. And we also have that constraint from before that our alpha and yn are equal to zero. So our solution for this then gives us our W value, our W from before, we substitute it here. And once we get our alphas from our quadratic program, we're going to substitute that in to our expression from the Lagrangian that we got for W. And this is going to give us our W vector just like before. And so the solution that we're going to get 
is going to minimize this expression, which is the max margin, max margin criterion. But we're also going to pay attention to the number of margin violations, this augmented formula that we had from the outset. All right. So this is our solution. And when we get our result from our quadratic programming solver, we're going to have two different classes of support vectors. We're going to have our so-called margin support vectors, and those are going to be the support vectors with no margin violation, psi n equal to zero. And that's going to be all of those in-sample points, xn, for which alpha n is greater than zero, but less than c. And then for those in-sample points for which alpha n is equal to c, those are called non-margin support vectors. Those are the support vectors for which a margin violation exists, and they're relatively few. Those are the xn for which psi n corresponding is greater than zero. So this point has a margin violation. This point has a margin violation. And so these are points for which yn w transpose xn plus b is less than 1 versus equal to 1. And it's less than 1 because it's closer to the boundary than the margin. All right. So as long as you violate the margin, you're still considered a support vector, albeit not a clean support vector. So you could have a point here that violates the margin a little bit, or you could violate the margin a lot, so n is large, and you're completely misclassified. And those are still considered non-margin support vectors. So that's all I had for today. With that, we will end there. And as usual, please stay healthy, stay safe, and I'll see you all on Tuesday.